a long way from home today, but uh, hopefully it's worth the trip and you in, enjoy the talk. Everything you'll see today is from, it's taken from my own collection and also in the books as well. So postcards, ephemera, air relics, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all my own. That's how I like to build my talks and that's how I get into the subject. What I'll do today, I'll begin with some background on the rise of the Zeppelin and the raids on Britain in 1915. Then moving on to 1916, we'll see how the battle against the Zeppelin menace unfolded and how a lucky half penny, a machine gun stoppage and a ghostly apparition changed history. Uh, the gentleman there with the, with the whiskers, uh, it's uh, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. He'd long realised that the concept of non-rigid airships, those without any framework uh, to maintain the shape of the gas bag, was a very extreme limited concept. So he turned his attention to the design of a rigid vessel. Uh, this would have a strong but light outer skeleton over which a linen outer cover would be fitted. The hydrogen gas for lifting the, uh, the airship would be held in a series of gas bags or balloonettes attached to the inside of the frame. This had a great advantage. The gas bags could be filled in and emptied individually and any links or leaks or punctures in one, one of the gas cells would not lead to the loss of the airship and that will come in That's quite important for later on. As you can see on the, on the slide there, um, the greater the amount of gas an airship contained, the more weight it could lift in the form of engines, fuel and payload as we get into the uh, First World War. On the 2nd of July uh, 1900, the first Zeppelin made its maiden flight over Lake Constance. Zeppelins quickly fired the imagination of the German people and they were a source of pride, fascination and wonder. The public even helped to finance their development when, they, uh, when Zeppelin's some of his airships crashed and there's public subscriptions and they uh, from obviously the public and also from the, uh, the King of Wurttemberg as well to, uh, to um, extend the project. The German military, of course, soon took an interest in this uh, marvellous weapon and by the outbreak of war, Count Zeppelin became the figurehead of a culture which embraced the technological advances of the day. The German public uh, clamoured for Zeppelins to bring terror and panic to the streets of, of the enemy and to strike at their the enemy's heart, London. A um, couple of examples here of Zeppelin propaganda postcards. Uh, we've got the uh, refrain, God stuff England, God punish England. And on the right there, um, we've got the uh, a, a classic um, Teutonic image there. We've got the kind of a Valkyrie figure. Um, we've got the Zeppelins, we've got airplanes, we've got the, Nate, the fleet. And the card is, uh, roughly translates as a uh, brave defending Germany's honour. Um, as propaganda things are, at the, in reality, at the outbreak of the war, Germany only possessed 11 airships, including three almost pleasure ships, commercial vessels. However, very quickly, further airships were already in production. January 1915 now. Following pressure from his advisers, the Kaiser gave his qualified approval for the aerial bombardment of Britain, but excluding London. On the 19th of January, the first raid was carried out by two, two Zeppelins of the Naval Airship Division, with bombs being dropped on, King, on Great Yarmouth, Kings Lynn and surrounding villages. Four people were killed that night, and the legend of the Zeppelins as the baby killers was born. You can see this is a fairly typical composite postcard. Uh, showing the, the, the raid in Great Yarmouth, published very shortly after the raid, where you've got showing the damage to the, uh, the various properties around Great Yarmouth. And the picture of the Zeppelin is a free war type, but uh, that's all they could get hold of at the time for the, uh, for the publishers. In turning to May 15, the Kaiser gave him reluctant approval for the bombing of London, east of a line parallel with the Tower of London. Um, the, obviously the Kaiser being a relative of the royal family uh, at the time was reluctant for the, uh, the great palaces of, of his uh, relatives to, to be bombed but uh, un, there was just general pressure from the high command and by May it, it caved in. So on the night of the 31st of May London was bombed for the first time by a Zeppelin. It was a 20 minute raid, um, um, claiming seven lives and injuring 35. It was just a, a short, 
present across London, but London was pretty well undefended. Um, there was there have been raids in in the uh, in in the East Coast, the surrounding areas, but London being hit was a turning point. And now, uh, with London being hit once, the 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 the, uh, the airship fleet uh, targeted London again. For example, the raid of the 8th and 9th of September 1915 on central London was in material terms the most destructive raid of the entire war, with damage valued at about £530,000. Doesn't sound much, but in today's money that's probably around £30 million. So that's a, that's a, a big old raid. Um, one bomb scored a direct hit on a, on a London bus, a number eight, just north of Liverpool Street, killing the driver and eight passengers. Um, no aeroplanes appeared in opposition to the Zeppelin that night, and falling shrapnel from anti-aircraft shells caused more damage on the ground than in the air. So by the end of 1915, there had been 20 raids on Britain, covering an area from Northumberland to Kent. So effectively, the Germans are coming over the East Coast and looking for targets, uh, some by accident, some by design, from, from Northumberland to Kent. Uh, the, there was a death toll. There was over 200 dead and 500 injured. And you've got to think, generation, this generation had hardly been accustomed to the idea of flight. Louis Blerio only crossed the channel in 1909, a few years ago. And the vision of a giant airship, you've got to think over 500 feet long, hovering overhead must have been incredible as well as terrifying experience. German successes resulted in increasing clamour for an effective defence to be put in place and to protect the capital and beyond, as existing anti-aircraft guns and aircraft have been able to uh, challenge the Zeppelin's superiority. It's effectively a matter of height. Aircraft can't, the, the rudimentary aircraft couldn't get high enough to challenge the Zeppelin's, and um, the, a lot of the anti-aircraft guns were not just not good enough. We, we started off using Boer War pom-pom guns which wouldn't have couldn't done much damage to anything, let alone an, an airship. But gradually, gradually, we, you know, they started to get the act together. As the raids intensified, you know, the, in the aircraft, there were, the, there were air raid precautions. But, uh, you've, but throughout 1915, the public interacted with attacks on their communities, taking the opportunity to pose by a bomb crater. Or, or what be considered an un, unacceptable breach of health and safety, even with um, an unexploded bomb. And these girls, it's Barbara Gower and Margaret Kemp and a 110 pound explosive bomb in Deerham in Norfolk. So yeah, there's you know, a slew of these postcards of people with them with standby bombs, standing bomb craters that bring the family, bring the friends, have their picture taken. It was. It was a major event, uh, event. and particularly before the different the door, the defence of the Real Mac kicked in, in really mid '15. You know, there was everyone. There's postcards published. That there was lots of press coverage about the, uh, the Zeppelin raids and the people interacting with them. And we move on to my favourite bit, really, before we get on to uh, talking about our friend Mr. Robinson. As I said, the air raids had intensified, and for the first time, there were simple air raid precautions. And by June uh, 1915, the public issued instructions for the first time. Comic postcard publishers were quick to reflect the many changes to the everyday challenges the public faced. There were, these are memorial-boosting postcards. The dominant theme is co collective resolve. Uh, they re reinforce the official line, government message that Britons everywhere could cope and eventually conquer the Zeppelin threat. It's keep calm and carry on in its earliest form. And they're funny postcards, but there is lots, there's lots of information packed into them, as we can see. How dare you walk on our front door? And you can see the poster behind. The public are advised to live in cellars during Zeppelin raids. Yes, that was the advice. You were to take to a cellar as a safer precaution or lie down in the open if you were caught out in the open, but what good that's going to do. And, and in London, from the earliest uh, attacks, it had been a custom for underground stations to offer shelter. It's not a Second World War construct. First of all, you, there was 
They were underground stations, they were deep, people went down them. And on the card on the, on the right there, first bit of luck I've had for years, she's going to buy one. So it's the, uh, the lady's gonna get, get herself a gas mask, a respirator. Uh, it was never actually seriously contemplated by the Germans, but there was a fear in Britain that the Germans would drop gas shells uh, on, on Britain and cause havoc that way. Again, the same thing in the Second World War. Everybody's wearing gas masks, issuing gas masks, same thing. Uh, we saw before the couple of examples of the, uh, the German postcards with the uh, Valkyries and Maidens and the, and the like and the Gothic script. But, and then they were, but there were other postcards. The Germans, people don't realise this. Oh, we'll, we'll come on to that in a sec. There's a couple more examples of the, uh, the humour, the kick calm and the carry on. And so a German example, uh, you know, it's not purely, it's not purely uh, the Gothic stuff, it's the um, humorous postcards to use to reinforce the message of the Zeppelin superiority in Germany, as, in Germany as well as this country. This is, again, you've got loads of things going on here. You've got Count Zeppelin in his, uh, with, his, with his uncle hat there, dropping a bomb. You've got the, uh, the British fleet, uh, paper boats blockaded. You've got London being, uh, being attacked, people cowering in terror, and uh, the sentry the hiding behind the, uh, the, the sentry box, uh, the, the, the frightened people underneath an umbrella. It's all going on there, you know, and that's the sort of message that the Germans put forward as much as we did over, as well. You know, you've got one on the, his chamber pot. He's, he's, not, he's a little frightened by the Zeppelin. But, you know, it's a serious sign. The measures were needed, such as improved anti-aircraft guns, link searchlight stations, and coordinated aircraft squadrons. And these began to challenge the raiders. Uh, and on the 1st of April, 1916, a Zeppelin was brought down by anti-aircraft fire in the sea north of Margate. So the first, the first implication of the tide be, being turned. And behind the scenes, ways are being devised to defeat the Zeppelin. Hydrogen, these things are filled with hydrogen, okay? But it, be, only become, it becomes highly flammable when mixed with oxygen. The science bit. The problem was how to ignite the hydrogen that escaped from any tear in the gas cell created by a bullet's passage. A bullet could just go straight through, the gas would leak out, uh, the Zeppelin crew would clamber up into the framework, patch it, pat, you know, patch the holes and off they go. So how are we gonna ignite it? But three men working independently finally found a way to strike at the Zeppelin's Achilles heel. And these gentlemen, uh, Coventry-based engineer and chemist James Buckingham, developed a phosphorus incendiary bullet, and John Pomeroy, a New Zealand inventor, New Zealand inventor, first created an explosive bullet back in 1902, and this was also subsequently adopted. Meanwhile, Flight Lieutenant Frank Brock, uh, actually is a remarkable man, who would lose his life in the Zeebrugge raid in April 18, working independently again uh, on another explosive bullet that offered, also offered an incendiary Element Brock is from the fireworks family, so you know he has an experience with things that go boom. So that's good. And there's also, I believe, the Sparklet Company, the ones who make the soda siphon, you make the soda siphons. They are involved in uh, in incendiary bullets too. So the trials of these explosive and phosphorus bullets were successfully carried out, and from July 1916, the machine gun drums of defending aircraft routinely filled with a combination of this ammunition. Right, now, enter the reluctant hero of our story, well, the star of our show, 21-year-old Lieutenant William Leif Robinson. He was born in his father's coffee estate in Polybetta, South Korg, India. That's uh, South India, sort of Bangalore way, on 14th of July, 1895. He was the youngest of seven children, all the children were given the mother's maiden name of Leif. Although he's popularly known as Leif Robinson, he was always known as Bill, Billy, or Willie, or sometimes even Robin or Robbie to his fellow officers. 
he signs letters to his parents as Billy. Um, together with his older brother, Harold, um, William um, t attended the Dragon School in Oxford first, and then Bishop Cotton's Boys' School in Bangalore when the fir family returned to India. Uh, another famous old boy of uh, Bishop's Cotton Boys was uh, England cricketer Colin, Colin Cowdery. Uh, the brothers finished their education at St. B's School in Cumbria, both enrolling in 1909, uh, with Robinson becoming a sergeant in the school's officer's training corps. Another old boy of St. B's, uh, Rowan Atkinson. So the war breaks out. Robinson's just 19 years old at this point. He entered Sandhurst Royal Military College on the outbreak of the war, and in December he was commissioned into the Worcestershire Regiment, and he's pictured in that uniform here. So this is, this is one of the first sort of stock pictures of him. He's looking very young there. And he's got his Worcestershire tiles on there. And he was posted to the 5th Militia Battalion, which is a training unit based uh, in Cornwall, around just over the border from Plymouth. But looking for adventure, his application to serve in West Africa was unsuccessful. Uh, but in March 1915, he joined the Royal Flying Corps and was quickly posted as an observer with number four squadron on the Western Front. As far as we can aware, here was no real desire, there was no history of flying or burning desire to fly, but he was just looking for an adventurous posting. But his uh, time on the Western Front was short-lived. In May, Robinson was invalided home after being wounded over Lille with two pieces of shrapnel from an anti-aircraft shell being removed from his right forearm. It only later emerged that an 1806 half penny, which Robinson kept in his left breast pocket for luck, was severely bent. The, f the coin had an apparently defective stray piece of shrapnel over his heart. That's an, that's an 1806 uh, penny, uh, half penny. Because if Robinson had it for lucky coin, I'm having its lucky coin. So you can see it's small and it's in his pocket. It, may, it could have saved his life. So by, by December 1915, he not only recovered, but qualified as a pilot, gaining his wings in a little less than three months. A very quick time. Obviously, he was a natural. But in February 16, he joined the newly reorganised B-Flight, a 39 Home Defence Squadron Royal Flying Corps, based at Sutton's Farm near Hornchurch in Essex. At the end of April, Robinson engaged his first Zeppelin, but his machine guns jammed. Also airborne from Sutton's farm that night was his then commander, one Captain Arthur Travers Ginger Harris. Armed with experimental explosive Brock ammunition, Harris's gun also experienced the stoppages and the raider slipped away. Now, what if Bomber Harris had been the first man to shoot down a Zeppelin on British soil? You know, and alternate history buffs out there, that's something I'd love to, love to explore one day. Um, so on such moments are history terms. You've got, you've got the lucky, lucky half penny saving his life, and the cause of history being altered by Harris not bringing down the Zeppelin, bringing down an airship, and the honour going to somebody else. On the night of the 2nd, 3rd September 1916, the Germans mounted their largest raid of the war comprising 12 airships from the Navy and four from the Army. So you've got this, the, you know, you've got the two competing air, for, um, you know, air forces almost, a bit like we have with the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service in, in this country. Um, it's mainly a, a more, more naval uh, Zeppelins. They, they, they embrace the technology much greater than the Army, but... Uh, you know, but they had combined operations, and this one was the big attack over, London, over, over the southeast of England. However, the task force was scattered by storms, but a Schutter Lance type SL 11, which is a wooden framed army airship, on its first mission pressed on to London. Oh, sorry, the, the, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you've got the, um, the actual the Zeppelins, which are with a very lightweight uh, metal framework, but there was also very similar technology, but the, um, the girders and the framework was wooden. Um, 
usually disparaged by the, uh, the Navy boys as a, a, calling them the glue potters, but uh, they were also, there were some, had some good technological advances in the, uh, the Schutter Lance as well as the Zeppelin. Robinson had taken off in his BE-2C biplane, which had been converted for night flying from Sutton's farm at 11.08 p.m. He was, he was patrolling the London skies after the authorities had been alerted to an imminent raid through intercepted radio traffic. Robinson was nearing the end of his patrol after another army airship had evaded him. It was now about 1.50 a.m. and the landing flares of Sutton's farm were in sight. However, he noticed a red glow to the northeast of London and went to investigate. SO-11 was commanded by a London-born uh, Hauptmann Wilhelm Schramm. His father had been the local representative for the Siemens electrical firm at the time of Wilhelm's birth. So he's a, a South London boy. Um, SO-11 had approached London from central London from the northeast, but had been forced to retreat by anti-aircraft fire after being picked up by the searchlights. You know, by this point, there was a proper guns and searchlights were linked and they put up a sterling defence of, of the capital. London was, were awoken by a crescendo of noise and tumbled from their beds to watch the spectacle that was about to unfold in the skies above them. 2.14 a.m. Waltham, Waltham Abbey searchlights and gun locked onto SO-11, a 570-foot a long airship flying about 11,000 feet. Robinson raced towards his quarry in an aircraft of just 27 feet in length. So it's a real David versus Goliath battle. It's going to unfold. Turning 800 feet below SO-11, Robinson emptied two drums of the new explosive ammunition upwards into the airship, but with no effect. With the airship now rising to 1,200 feet, or 1,000 feet rather, Robinson took up position behind her and about 500 feet below concentrating the third drum into one point in the rear underside. The explosive bullets were able to open large holes in the gas bags, with the incendiary bullets igniting the now volatile hydrogen, and this is the result. <clears throat> That's why just a bit of a quote here. A spectator described the scene vividly. The air was full of, report of the reports of anti-aircraft guns and falling bombs. Suddenly, a great blaze of light appeared in the sky at an altitude of many thousands of feet. A great column of flame shot up, and a great crowd of smoke could be seen rolling above the fire. The flames shot up hundreds of feet. As the radar slowly fell to earth, its appearance suggested a huge fiery parachute, as you can see there. The blazing mass gathered speed as it fell, whilst the flames alternately, alternately expanded and contracted. By the time the airship was within 1,000 feet of the ground, all the gas had apparently left the bag, and only the solid framework and gondolas containing the wrecked engines and scorched and lifeless bodies of the crew reached the ground. So in, few, few, in full view of the metropolis, the explosion actually could have seen miles away up to a radius of 60 miles, they say. SO-11 fell in a roaring mass of flame, striking the ground at the Hertfordshire hamlet of Cuffley. Millions of Londoners cheered the unknown hero who had been the first to shoot down an airship over mainland Britain. It was a wonderful tonic, coming shortly after the uh, indecisive naval engagement at Jutland, and of course with the lengthy casualty list coming in from the Somme. Railway, railway whistles blew, factory hooters were sounded, and whilst people poured onto the streets singing and dancing, um, and people broke out into spontaneous traditions of God save the king and rule Britannia. It was a, a major event. Robinson landed safely at Sutton, Sutton's farm with little petrol and oil left in his machine's tanks. The exhausted pilot was borne shoulder high in triumph from his aircraft. On 3rd of September, which was later referred to as Zepp Sunday, news of Robinson's victory spread with incredible speed. Over the next two days, over 10,000 people travelled to the tiny village and police and troops were called in to control the crowds who were clamouring for souvenirs of the wreck even though it's illegal to take anything under the defence of the, uh, the realm regulations. There had been a thunderstorm and the film soon became a quagmire and you can see just a, a press photo taken in the aftermath 
of uh, the, air, the airship coming down. Robinson visited the crash site twice on the Sunday. Wearing his uniform in the morning, he was mobbed by crowds once word got around who he was. Always did Robinson return in civilian clothes in the afternoon, but many of the people who had cheered him in the morning were still there and recognised him again. I'll just quickly address a, a point you may have already noticed. Uh, when SL-11 was shot down, it was described officially and in the press as Zeppelin L-21. Uh, this misidentification persisted for decades and was probably done so for propaganda purposes. It looks, it's great press if you brought down a Zeppelin. If you say, oh, I brought down a shooter Lance, nobody's going to know what the hell that is. So, but that thing that was in the press and it really didn't get changed a great deal to the 60s, really. And I think L yeah, L21 was actually brought down uh, in, in, in the autumn, in November, in November uh, 1916. But uh, by that point, nobody had made the connection. Yeah. On the uh, this is the uh, this is the Plow Pub, uh, Plow Inn in Cuffley. That's the uh, which is just yards away from where um, the airship uh, uh, crashed. Uh, the formal inquest was conducted in the parlour bar. Where else would you Where else would you have an inquest? Um, on the sixth of of September, so things are moving quickly here. The crew was buried in a communal grave this, with a separate one for the remains of what they believed to be the commander. The burial was with four military honours at Mutton Lane Cemetery in Potter's Bar and was vigorously opposed and extra police were on hand. You know, there's a lot of talk in the press. How do we dare give these, uh, these murderers, these baby killers, a, a, a Christian burial? But um, the... Uh, the authorities, Royal Flying Corps, you know, they wanted to uh, uh, honour the honour honour what were um, other brave men who risked their lives to uh, in the, for their for their country. At the cemetery gate, gates, forty-year-old Elena Farrington threw eggs at the coffin. Um, she was arrested and subsequently suddenly fined five shillings. I'm trying to do some more research on on Farrington. Uh, evidently, the story was that she uh, had uh, been in, seen many, some of the other Zeppelin raids on London and affected her nerves and, uh, and upset her children. And I'm researching that she may have been, or some of her family were refugees from the Franco Prussian War, and there was an inbuilt German hatred. But um, early days of my research on that. And there's the, uh, not far from the plough, was a tin church. Uh, at St Andrews, which was turned into a temporary mortuary for the, uh, the remains of the crew. And that church is no longer there, but there's, St Andrews is now further down into Cuffley Village. This is another good uh, detailed press photograph. You've got the, um, the church at the back there, and you've got, they're rolling up miles and miles of, of wire, as you can see there. Um, there's not much else of it. Remember, this is a wooden framed airship that's come down, so most of it's going to be burnt. As the eyewitness scout said, just the engine, go the engines and the engine gondolas are the main bits remaining. The rest is wire, and there's a hell of a lot of it. And we'll see how it changes in a little. And there's some uh, illustrated war news picture of the funeral. Um, and you've got the... Uh, you know, the, you got the coffins there uh, being uh, brought to the graveside. For shooting down SO-11, Robinson was now the most famous pilot in the country and could not go without official recognition for long. On the 9th of September, King George V handed him the Victoria Cross at Windsor Castle. So in record time, a Victoria Cross had been issued. Robinson's VC and other medals were held privately, actually by the family, until November 1988, and were sold at auction uh, for 99,000, including commission, which is nothing from what they'd actually they'd fetched today. They're now part of the Ashcroft collection in the Imperial War Museum in London. You can go and see them up in the, the top bit. Robinson was a reluctant 
national hero, fated, fated wherever he went. His gallant deed was celebrated in numerous postcards portraying the airship being brought to Earth. And there's a couple of smashing examples there. You've got a souvenir of destruction. You've got Cuffley underneath. You've got searchlights. You've got a flaming airship. You've got Robinson in a portrait in a Royal Flying Corps outfit with laurel leaves denoting victory around him. A slightly odder card over there as a fly in a terrible representation of a plane. But you've got uh, the, uh, I don't know if you can read that, I've strafed the blighter. So uh, that's pretty much what he said after he got back down to earth at Sutton's farm. And there's the image of uh, the airship being brought to earth. Um, these examples are great too. Um, this is by my favourite postcard artist, uh, G. Shepherd. He got depicting the airship as the Kaiser with the flame moustaches uh, ablaze. Or then the unfortunate crew piling up in a, in a macabre representation of SL 11's fall coming down and the unexpected invasion of England. Soon, even the smallest piece of wire and debris from the downed airship were being kept as keepsakes or sold for war charities. A couple of examples, postcards there. You've got a couple of the official Red Cross cards there. And one which was uh, for, a, for a local hospital uh, in North London. You know, people with the, they would gather up all this wire and, and set it on. There's, and there's some other bits there which are purportedly fragments taken of molten metal which were taken from the, from the Cuffley site. Or you get these turn up quite a lot. Little people would just have little envelopes of just teeny bits of wire and they would keep them until this day as souvenirs. This is a momentous event in the history of the country. And, uh, and the tide turned as a result. Um, and they, you know, obviously there's, great, there's stories, you know, about the veracity of the, the Zeppelin wire. There was, all these were solved. Did they all come from, uh, from the SL-11 or did they come from other subsequent wrecks? You know, something you never know. I know there's uh, late, later times when Zeppelins came down, there was people uh, enterprisingly cutting up buckets and uh, all sorts of things and selling them off as uh, bits of Zeppelin. So what we might think today is a bit of a genuine relic might have just been a, a contemporary uh, bucket or, or, or a bit of bicycle part from the time. But, uh, but you can tell, I think. Right, where were we? I get, I get sidetracked with bits of wire. It's one, one of the things I like. Um, Robinson could have actually lost his life just days later. Preparing for a night patrol on the 16th of September, his trusty B2C hit a hedge on takeoff and nose dived into the ground, bursting into flames. The pilot was uninjured, but the aircraft, like the airship it had recently destroyed, was a heap, a smouldering heap of wooden wires. So again, another twist of fate. He's brought down the Zeppelin. He could have lost his life days later. And again, history changes. After Robinson's success, the home defence squadrons were inspired. On the 23rd of September, 11 airships, including the new R-class, or super Zeppelins as we call them, set out on a raid. The night was to become known as the Great Double Event. L-32 was shot down near Billericay by 2nd Lieutenant Frederick Sowery, another 39th Squadron pilot and Robinson's best friend. And 39 and L-33 was brought down virtually intact at Little Wigborough, 30 miles away as a result of anti-aircraft fire. And you can see the wreck of L-32 now, and you can see the difference between when a Zeppelin crashes and when a Shutter Lance crashes by the mile, this, the, all the framework and the girders which held the... Uh, the beast together. And a nearby Little Wigborough, a baby daughter was born to Mr. and Mrs. Clark about the same time that L-33 crashed. At the suggestion of the doctor who attended the delivery, the baby was christened Zeppelina. This is actually quite the fashion at the time. Um, for example, the parents of the Neville twins born on the, that night, or the 2nd or 3rd of September, decided to name them William, uh, Sidney Zeppelin and William Cuffley. But the local vicar had other ideas and Sidney's middle name was changed from Zeppelin to Robinson. 
Um, there was many similar examples reported in the press at the time. And uh, the ever modest uh, Robinson mentions it in, in, a in a letter to his family. As I dare say you will have seen in the papers, babies, flowers and hats have been named after me. Also poems and prose have been dedicated to me. Oh, it is too much. And there's uh, L33, the framework coming down intact, which would have given the residents of that cottage behind a bit of a fright. Um, I've walked that ground and you can, you can see that you can walk the length of, of the airship and that's these things, you know, 650, over 600 feet long, 650 feet long. That's a bit of a walk round. And here we go, another one. So the night of the 1st of October, another formation of Zeppelins approached London. I think they would have learnt their lesson by now. An L-31 was shot down by 26-year-old 2nd Lieutenant Walston Tempest, another 39 Squadron pilot. So these 39 Squadron boys were in the thick of it and having great success. Um, L-31 went down in flames, piling up on the outskirts of Potter's Bar, not too far away from Cuffley. The main portion of the airship wrapped, wrapped itself around an oak tree, and the Zeppelin oak became a local monument until it was cut down in the 30s. And you note now that the police and the authorities have got their act together, and the, the site is very quickly cordoned off to uh, deter the, uh, the, um, the souvenir hunters. And also, there's a nice, a nice image of, uh, of Tempest. Um, who got the DSO for uh, bringing down the Zeppelin, as did Sowery. Uh, no VCs for, for them, just for our friend Robinson. The crew of L31 was buried at Mutton Lane Cemetery alongside the crew of SO11. Uh, it was convenient and it was all done by the same, same undertaker and organised in the same fashion. After the war, it was decided to instigate an annual remembrance event at the cemetery to cement Anglo-German relations. However, by 1933, the, uh, the ceremony began to have a strong Nazi presence, complete with Nazi salutes, and there's images of that in the newspapers. And in 1934, the vicar of Potters Bar declined to take part in the ceremony in view, he pointed out, of the Nazi attitude to Christianity. During the 19, early 1960s, the remains of both of the crews were removed for reinterment at the German war cemetery at Cannock Chase in Staffordshire together with their fallen comrades from other airships, such as the, you know, the L-32 uh, crew and, the, and others. Uh, following Robinson's success and the ward of his VC, the inhabitants of Hornchurch asked for subscriptions to present it with the cup, and over 3,000 donations were received. When Sowery repeated the feat, the villagers were unsure how to proceed. Robinson settled the, manor, the matter writing, since Lieutenant Sowery has performed a similar deed, I wish him to equally share your gift, whatever it may be. As far as the range of being raid, guess what? <laughs> Tempest shoots down another one. So the villagers decided to include him as well, and each pilot received a handsome silver cup. Examples there, and I've also had the privilege of seeing and touching the uh, Sowery's silver cup uh, a few years ago at the centenary. And there's um, Robinson there in his uh, best uniform. Um, and it uh, looks like Sowery over there. There he is, having, having a sleep. October the 1st, 1916, was the last time a Zeppelin deliberately set out to attack London. And that was in just under one month, the public had witnessed the demise of the Zeppelin as a credible threat. Well, so a third of the raid, sporadic raids into 1917 and 1918, the, um, the air raid initiative passed from airships to aeroplanes. Aviation technology had advanced to such an extent that biplanes with a bomb load of 1,000 pounds could successfully reach England from bases in occupied Belgium. And that's a story perhaps for another day. Eventually, the Zeppelin raids were just continuing for the nuisance value only. The Zeppelin threat had been overcome where an airplane armed with a new incendiary and explosive ammunition got an airship in its sights, it was inevitably doomed. Again, Comic Postcard publishes a quick to reflect on the celebrity of the airmen and their legions of female admirers. We go, neither Jack nor Tommy can my whole affections win because I love the flying man who bombs the Zeppelin. 
and um, Sutton's Farm, where they were, these guys are based, now came under virtual siege as a result. Uh, noted uh, musical theatre actress Alice, Alice Delicia, uh, later the Follies Berger, was a frequent visitor to Sutton's Farm. See there. Uh, they, on, you've got uh, Robinson and Salary there, um, and in the middle there is uh, Captain Sidney Stammers. Um, Stammers was the, was the rogue of the place, by all accounts, and there were stories of him disappearing around the back of the sheds with a certain mademoiselle, but maybe not dressed like that. Um, there was something akin to hysteria sweeping the country full of Robinson's success. You know, he's, he's, he's a rock star now. He found it impossible to travel without being accosted by well-wishers, and he was soon being paraded around the country on official engagements, including a visit to the Ely's K, uh, cartridge factory in Edmonton with John Pomeroy, where the inventor's bullets that Robinson had fired were ma had been made. Interesting story now. In 1931, it was reported that Major C.C. C. Coley of the Munitions Department of the War Office stated that he saw a tweed-jacketed white trails of ghosts in his office one day and told his secretary to seek out such a man. Pomeroy was, bought, was identified and, and brought to him, and Coley spiritually convinced that he was trustworthy, subsequently persuaded Rothenson to take up Robin, to Pomeroy's bullets, result being the destruction of Zeppelin, Zeppelin and Pomeroy's receipt of a £25,000 reward. This story is not true, but it's... Uh, it, it's a great story, and it's uh, circulated in the 30s when the uh, particular spiritualist movement was uh, at its peak uh, following the First World War. And it's only appeared in, in newspapers, and just, it's just one of these, as you research it, these weird and wonderful stories and myths come up about Zeppelin raids and the and airships and, and what the pilots did. Robinson received significant sums of money as gifts and prizes, over £4,000, some of which was used to buy a new Prince Henry Vauxhall car, pretty much one of the world's first sports cars. Financial rewards were frowned upon by the authorities and regulations were quickly passed to stop this from happening again. Soon tiring of all the attention and being rested from flying duties after the crash of his B2C, Robinson pressed for a posting on the Western Front. He didn't, didn't, want, didn't want to sit back. Now promoted to captain, he got his wish and was posted 48 Squadron as a flight commander on the Western Front. However, Robinson was shot down and taken prisoner on the 5th of April 1917, together with his New Zealand-born observer, Lieutenant Warburton, flying one of the new Bristol F2A fighters, uh, an example of which is here. It's a more substantial beast than the uh, B-2C and was to get a, a good reputation as on the Western Front. Uh, this was Robinson's, you've got to remember, first operational patrol in France since his role in observer in 1915. And the nature of air war had changed considerably in the intervening two years. Robinson's flight had the misfortune of running into JASTA, JASTA 11, commanded by Manfred von Richthofen the Red Baron himself, and the Flying Circus brought down four of the six British machines. I found an account of Robinson explaining that owing to the wrong quality of oil being used, his guns fell to fire and being outnumbered, he was forced to land. The victory over Robinson was credited to Feldwebel Sergeant Sebastian Festner flying an Albatross D3. Festner would himself be killed in action just 20 days later. And that's... Uh, on the left there yeah, uh, with uh, Richthofen and uh, his pals. As a prisoner of war, Robinson was an inveterate escaper and on one occasion was recaptured four miles away from the Swiss border. However, Robinson had a harsh time in captivity, largely due to the notoriety attached with his VC, suffering at the hands of the notorious Niemeyer twins Heinrich and Karl the commanders of the Klaus Hall and Holtzminden camps, respectively. Uh, as you see there, Robinson at Holtzminden, the victim of a malevolent scheme of repression. Um, it's quite a decent camp as it, as it goes, uh, Holtzminden, with the, uh, 
blocks A and B for the, uh, for, for the officers. But uh, he was badly treated, Robinson, you know, especially by, uh, by, by the, the Nehemiahs. Uh, and there's all sorts of stories circulating about him, uh, you know, being kept in solitary confinement, being starved of rations, even being beaten or whipped at various points. They weren't a nice people and they did not like him. Uh, inevitably, Robinson's health suffered badly whilst a prisoner. Arriving, arriving back in Britain, following repatriation on 14th December 1918, he quickly fell sick with influenza. Uh, he died on 31st of December 1918 at the Stanmar home of a friend, Captain Noel Clifton, uh, at Lavender Cottage, Gordon Avenue, Stanmore, and is buried at Harrow Weald. His sister, Baroness Haking, and his fiancée, Joan Whipple, nursed him to the end. Thousands turned up to line the roots of Robinson's funeral. Uh, the procession was led, was led by the central band of the RAF, and a fly-pass of aircraft dropped across of laurel leaves, which was placed on the coffin. The bearers included his friend Sowery, now, now a major in the RAF. And this pesco photograph of Robinson's grave was taken on 14th November 1988. The gentleman pictured his squadron lean leader, H.E. Tim Hervey, 93 years old at the time, who was knew Robinson well and as a prisoner of war and shared many of the escape attempts. And just going on to just um, tidy up some little bits here. I was proudly part of the committee set up by the Northall and Coughley Parish Council to commemorate the centenary of Robinson's remarkable feat in, 19, in, in 2016. There are ceremonies at the VC Memorial Obelisk on the left there, which had first been unveiled in 1921 on the East Ridgeway and at the uh, rebuilt St Andrew's Church. The bronze Royal Flying Corps wings on the memorial were stolen in the early 1980s. However, they were replaced and rededicated on the centenary of Robinson's death on 31st of December 2018. Both the memorial and Robinson's grave have grade two listed status. So they replaced it with this kind of uh, perspexy granite block, and that's now um, been relocated to the back of the memorial. And they did a pretty good job of matching up the, the wings. Also on the centenary, a commemoration stone for Robinson, donated by the Department of Communities and Local Government, was unveiled on new plinth built in Cuffley's Millennium Gardens. The unveiling party included Sir Freddie Sowery, retired Air, Vos, Vice, retired Air Marshal of the Royal, Flying, Royal Air Force, and the son of Frederick Sowery. Um, Sir Freddie died um, in July 19, 1896. So it went full circle. We, you know, we went to get somebody, the son of somebody who was Robinson, Robinson's friend, and Sir Freddie brought with Sowery's um, um, uh, silver cup with him. And also, on, and you can see the, um, the plinth they made in the, uh, and the, what it looks like now. That was a devil's own job because they, they managed to start off by putting Worcester Regiment on it. So we had to send it back. And this was William wrong. So we had to send it back again. So there's a couple of dodgy, <laughs> there's a couple of whole ones, uh, it's paving stones somewhere. Um, the Zeppelin was a terror weapon, but his attempts to undermine Britain's morale and its will to fight was ultimately unsuccessful, due, due in no small part to the events of that September night, where the fiery horror of SO-11's demise was witnessed by a watching multitude. William Lee Robinson won his place as a hero of the nation thanks to a lucky coin, a machine gun stoppage, and perhaps a tweed jacketed um, apparition. I think, thank you. Um, just to end, as part of these centenary celebrations, the, we got a couple of guys to sing a song which was written, which was published about the following year about the, the Zeppelin being brought down over London town. And I think that will do it because I need a drink of water.